Good morning. It is really a pleasure to be here. To be here speaking to all of you who I know, just like us, work in the trenches every day in water conservation and efficiency and strive to make a difference with the work that we do. And I'm, I'm especially pleased to be able to be the keynote this year and to um, give you some of perhaps my views that hopefully will be of interest. Um, my dad passed away six days ago, and when he passed away, um, it got me thinking about life, about what we do in our life, what the meaning is of our lives, and what we want to accomplish uh, before we also die. And so life for me became a passion about something, about a desire to be meaningful and to make a difference in, in what I was attempting to do. And in, in thinking about my life so far and, and maybe what's still ahead of me, um, I got to thinking that this keynote might be a great opportunity for me to do some reflections here at the podium to uh, talk with you about what I have seen since I joined this field in uh, 1989. Um, and so it'll be a little different keynote than what you've heard in the past. Um, past uh, WSI keynotes have been wonderful summaries of our water crises, um, super descriptions of the, the terrific programs that are underway to deal with uh, all kinds of issues from managing water resources in a more meaningful way to communicating about those. You've, you've heard from some uh, very accomplished and very uh, intelligent and driven speakers. Um, I think this is going to be a different talk. Um, as you can see, there's no PowerPoint. So we're not going to do a PowerPoint today. I, I, I want to use this opportunity to talk with you and hopefully at the end to l allow enough questions, time period for questions so that you can also talk back to me. Um, this is my chance to talk openly and candidly about what I see that's happened in our field and what's facing us in the future. So let's just talk a little bit about just water itself. Yes, we all know it's a fundamental, basic human need, but it's also an emotional connection. If we think about the things that we do in our recreational lives, you know, the, the trips we make to lakes, the rafting we do on rivers, the, the waterfalls, the oceans, the water is a key piece of who we are as human beings. And unfortunately, water doesn't become top of mind for the consumers that we serve. Unless there's a drought or unless there's a flood, water is largely an ignored and forgotten topic. And it's certainly not perceived as a national priority. I, um, I decided to make it a little project to look and see when the last time was water was mentioned in a presidential debate. I think we're all watching with great amusement what's going on right now in, in terms of the elections. And the last time water was actually an issue in a presidential debate was 1936. Those were the Dust Bowl years. So since then, this has not been a national topic of conversation. And yet we're in a crisis. I mean, the, the, the entire West, is, as uh, Mr. Edsminger so eloquently put, the entire West is facing some droughts of epic proportions. It's stretching across the country. It's even affecting parts of Canada. Um, National Geographic published an article this year that said the worst drought in a thousand years is predicted for the American West if we're on our current trajectory of greenhouse gas emissions. If we don't reduce those, you know, the kinds of droughts we're experiencing on a one to two percent basis are, are now going to become regular. But somehow, somehow, this is not getting the public's attention. And why is this? Uh, I spent some years working in the water utility industry, and I think it's because we did just too good a job. You know, the water utility industry has made it their mission over the past 50, 60 years to be the strong, silent provider of water to their communities. They didn't want to have to have anyone think about how that water got to the tap. And so the consumer in North America no longer is connected to what is a very real miracle of water delivery in this country. Our safe, clean water is unparalleled in the rest of the world, and we take it completely for granted. The consumer actually takes it more than for granted. They actually think the bottled water they buy at much higher expense is more safe uh, to drink. Um, so how did I end up in this field? This is part of my reflection to you. Um, I was an Earth Day baby who decided when Earth Day hit in 1970 that this is what I wanted to do with my life. And I spent 18 years working for an environmental regulatory agency in the state of Connecticut. 
And at some point I said, okay, I've spent 18 years in government and you know, it's time for me to see the real world. So I went to work for water utility. And I went to the water utility world in the capacity of public and governmental affairs. And suddenly one day, after I'd been there about a year, um, the general manager came down and said, oh, by the way, we have a new assignment for you. You're gonna be in charge of water conservation. And my reaction was, water conservation? I don't want water conservation. I don't know anything about it. And his answer was, and this is probably typical, well, no one else here wants it. Tag your it, because you do the government stuff. Learning it can't be that hard. Just go to a conference. That was 1989. So once I got into it, I understood why in this field we are so driven, why we are so passionate about what we believe in. We're passionate because we're advocating for preservation of a resource that gets isolated and sidelined within our own water utilities. In public affairs, I was in the wing of the, of the utility building. I wasn't close to anybody in engineering or operations. We were just those people over in public affairs, and so conservation was those people over in public affairs. Saving water is antithetical, to fundamentally antithetical to a utility's mission to sell water. So we have spent a lot of time getting over that perception hurdle. Uh, Paul Lander said something great in our uh, meetings yesterday. He said, yeah, we're the people who were hired to, like salmon to swim upstream. We're swimming against the tide of what people expect in the water utility business. But despite this barrier, we've been really phenomenally successful. We've made great strides since the early 1980s when Bill Medaus first published his water conservation guide and started uh, us thinking all about this issue. So I thought I would quickly go through some of those successes. Success number one, our demand is down. Even though North America, US and Canada started out as being the highest per capita water using nations in the world, we are making great strides. And the US, our indoor, well actually US and Canada, uh, our indoor average uh, gallons per capita per day under the reuse study in 1999, the residential end uses study, indoor water use was around 69.3 gallons per person per day. In this recent residential end use study, which is about to be published, it's now down to 58.6 gallons per person per day. And in high efficiency homes, that number is down to 36.7 gallons. We are getting there, we are making progress. And that progress is due largely to federal and state efficiency standards that we have gotten passed over the years. We've, the water sense program's been passed, the utility incentive programs that we've all been working on over the years have been effective, have gotten consumers to change out their appliances and, and plumbing. And we're smarter now about our outdoor water use. We're, we're making great strides in that area. Uh, California in its drought is reporting now that there's a 31% reduction in July of 2015 over July of 2014. That's remarkable. It certainly gets to the fact that yes, we are successful, we are making an impact. Um, and it's long-term impact. Uh, in 2010, Los Angeles sold the same amount of water that they did in 1970, but they've got over a million more people. So that's progress. Success number two, we're finally believed. I mean, how many years did we spend where we were, you know, rattling the cages in our utility department saying, no, we can provide that same water supply more cost-effectively through conservation than if you uh, build another reservoir. We have now been recognized as a cost-effective contributor to water supply reliability and as a tool for climate change adaptation. This is all good news. The word resiliency starts with efficient water use. People now get that. Uh, they didn't get that when I started in 1989. Um, now we know it's a least cost option that makes economic sense for us and we can clearly prove the utility benefit to it. So that's actually, as little as it might sound, a big, a big success. Success number three, we finally got a label. We stopped having Energy Star Envy and we got our labeling program. It's going to be 10 years old next year. Um, this is a phenomenal success for us. We're very proud of the WaterSense program. To date, WaterSense has saved over 1.1 trillion gallons of water, over $21.7 billion in water and energy bills. It saved 146 billion kilowatt hours of electricity, 54 million metric tons of carbon dioxide. These are all great successes. Success number four, we now care about water loss. 
Once a minor program at a utility with maybe one person assigned, leakage recovery is now a priority. And we're really making waves to, to make this happen in, in utilities across the country. New methods and standards have been developed uh, for non-revenue water management internationally and been adopted in the United States. The American Water Works Association has their M36 manual. George Kunkel has been a real leader in making that happen. And now we're really focusing on it. Uh, states are beginning to require regular comprehensive water audits. Audits. Success number five, we are finally linking water and energy. It started with the Energy Policy Act in 1992. In the Energy Policy Act, we had water efficiency standards. That went way back then. But the California Energy Commission did some seminal work in 2005 that really identified how much of their electricity and gas load was related to water and, and discovered it was an astonishingly high percentage. Saving water saves energy. And we can calculate the greenhouse gas emission reductions that come from saving water. We have models of the Alliance for Water Efficiency that do that. And this is all a very good thing. But we're not done. These are great successes, but we have lots more to do. When a residential customer can legally use 11.8 million gallons a year in, in a drought area like Los Angeles, you know we still have work to do. 11.8 million gallons a year for, for a house, a single family house. We have work to do. And this is not the future we want. We want a different future, don't we? Um, the Alliance for Water Efficiency and its strategic plan set out a vision for what we want to see in 2030. And this is what I'm going to read to you right from what we said in the plan. The water efficient North American consumer in 2030 will be living in a household with smart metering both indoors and out with a dashboard with real-time information on combined water and energy use, maximum use of gray water, and more thoughtfully designed landscapes with smart irrigation solutions, such as irrigation fixtures managed by sensors focusing on actual plant water needs. On the commercial side, the commercial and industrial customer will be fully recycling their process water, water and energy will be optimized together, and no potable water will be wasted to drains. Stormwater will be a resource for water supply and not a waste stream. More water will be retained on site in all customer classes for reuse for non-potable purposes. That's our vision for 2030. How do we get there? We need changes. We need policy changes at all levels of government. We need better and higher incentives for uh, incentivizing end use reduction by the consumers and coming not just from the water utilities operating budget. It's, it's a terrible way to fund long term benefit, to fund it out of current operating year budgets. And, but that's what we do now. That has to change. We need a much more informed and engaged consumer. We need to amp up how that consumer participates with us in our long-term decision making. So I have 15 ideas, and I promise I'll go through them quickly, for how we get there from here. Here's idea number one. We need to finally authorize the Water Sense program. For God's sakes, it's 10 years old. Let's do it already. Write your congressional representatives. Let's make this happen. Let's authorize it. Let's fund it properly. Energy Star gets 40 million a year. Water Sense barely gets 2 million a year. Water is a crisis issue for us. Let's do this already. WaterSense products are available nationwide. Um, a study was recently done by the Plumbing Manufacturers International, and we're, we're, you know, we're wondering about the numbers, but if they're anywhere remotely correct, we have work to do. They say the national penetration average is about 7% of WaterSense fixtures across the country. I am hoping that's really wrong. But if it's right, we have work to do. Number two. We need parity with energy efficiency. This is another thing I'm kind of sick of. This is my biggest beef. Energy efficiency has got great funding, great policy direction, centralized federal uh, direction. Uh, they have tax exemptions. They have tax credits. They have subsidies. Um, energy utilities get paid for greenhouse gas emission reductions, but the water utilities who are saving those uh, greenhouse gas emissions through their water conservation programs don't get to share in any of that money. We have to change that. We have to be able to incentivize saving energy with water. We need a carbon protocol. You know, we're not going to be able to do anything in cap and trade market if we don't have a carbon protocol for water conservation. And we need to consider a public benefits goods charge. That has been very successful in energy. Why don't we do it in water? We need to build the same sort of support structure for water efficiency that they have had in energy efficiency for almost 30 years. Third thing, 
Show me the money. Remember that the Tom McGuire movie? Show me the money. Federal water incentives are largely non-existent in water. Think of the federal money that goes for energy efficiency and the, the huge investments that get made in energy efficiency. Yes, the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation has funding, but it's a fraction of what's available on the energy efficiency side, and we need parity on that. And so when will our water crisis nationally get to a point where this will finally happen, that the feds will really begin to address water. Yes, we know it's a state's rights issue, but that doesn't mean the feds can't incentivize better how we make our water use more sustainable. So this is another one of my beefs. Fourth area, let's focus on outdoor now, not on indoor. We have really done a great job indoor. It's time to do it in the outdoor sector. Outdoor water use is still poorly understood. It's ripe for innovation and improvement at the consumer and use level, at the landscape contractor level, at the designer level, at the irrigation manufacturer level. These are all partnerships we need to put together. It doesn't help us to say, well, I'm anti-turf. No, no one is anti-turf. We are anti-water waste. And we need to change how we perceive the water requirement of the landscape. And we need to work together. Um, the irrigation industry is an industry that I would love a better and closer working relationship with. They don't trust us right now. They think of us as anti-turf. Um, we are not viewed as a partner in the way we are viewed as a partner in the plumbing industry. And yes, it's taken us some time to get there, but I'm very proud of the relationships, the working relationships we have with plumbing manufacturers and, and plumbing uh, stakeholders. And I, I crave to have those same kind of relationships in the irrigation world because Outdoor water use is our next frontier. This is what we have to solve. Number five, let's not forget commercial and industrial. Yes, we focus on the residential consumer because it's actually easier to do the residential programs. Commercial and industrial is harder. The kinds of uh, audits and incentives that we did uh, have done in the past for commercial customers aren't going to work quite as well uh, as we thought. Um, there, we, we need to approach this in a much more different way. We need to tap into energy partnerships. Uh, energy utilities have you know, customer service reps for every large commercial and industrial customer. Maybe we need to develop uh, some sort of partnering relationship with them. We need to target commercial and industrial incentives for where we'll get the most bang for the buck. Number six, let's keep the water working where it already is. We need more integrated water management and reuse. We need to think about this more productively, not only for our existing development, but for new development. We use potable water once and we discharge it. We throw it away, basically. Why don't we reuse it? Why don't we stop drinking water treatment for all uses of water that don't require potable water standards? Why don't we think about fit for purpose water and, and figuring out how we can take the water that's already in site, on site and use it more productively? Um, we need good federal guidance on this. There are epidemiological concerns, legitimate ones, and we need to engage with the Center for Disease Control and EPA on this issue. And it's, I want to give a shout out to the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission who is working very hard on this issue. They've issued a, something called a blueprint for on-site water systems, and they talk about this issue. They're talking to public health officers about how we try to make this happen. But it's going to need policy changes, and that's something that's on my list. Number seven, unintended consequences. I don't know about you, but I'm getting really tired of seeing this in the, in the newsprint, in the media. Water conservation has unintended consequences. Well, maybe. Revenue shortfalls are not an unintended consequence, in my opinion. These you can plan for. You know, and we have models that show you this, we know what your demand reductions are going to be with chosen water conservation options. You can plan for those reductions. Revenue shortfalls is not an unintended consequence. Just failure to address it becomes that. But there probably are some things we haven't thought about. Um, recent press coverage is sewer odors and sewer pipe corrosion. That's being blamed now on water conservation, the accelerated uh, corrosion in sewer pipes. And the whole phenomenon of water aging, that water is spending a lot longer in the distribution system. It's losing its chlorine residual by the time it gets to the customer meter. And we're seeing cases of Legionella. Most of it's in cooling towers, but we are seeing it in, in end-use fixtures as well. And Legionella is scary. The Center for Disease Control says that 58% of all waterborne diseases recorded in the U.S. are Legionella, but 98% of the deaths 
are Legionella. So this is a killer, and we need to pay attention to this. And we need to research how we fix this problem. And some of the options are, are, are have been talked about. You know, our water heaters need to go back up to 140 degrees. At lower that than that, they're breeding Legionella in the water tank. Uh, point of use disinfection is something we're probably going to have to look at, UV. And of course, utilities now are doing regular system flushing, which means that your consumers who are being told they can only water once a week are seeing thousands of gallons running down the street because you have to flush your system to pull that chlorine residual through the system. So we've got a problem here. This is one we have to pay some attention to. Number eight, we need to integrate non-revenue water management with water use efficiency at the consumer end use level. And not just because customers see a burst main and say, well, why are you asking me to conserve when you're spewing water all over the place? It's because it makes sense to integrate those two topics together. Um, our, we're going to be releasing a new version of our uh, Alliance for Water Efficiency tracking tool next year, and that version is going to do more with integration of water loss management. Um, and I want to just encourage you to consider going to yet another conference, but this will be a good one too. Uh, there will be a conference in Atlanta December 8th and 9th. It will be the first North American water loss conference, and uh, it's got a terrific program. I encourage you to go, and just for you, you the WSI attendees, you have a special code to still get the early registration rate. Just type the word LEAK, L-E-A-K, and you'll get uh, $50 off the registration. But this will be the first time that we're going to try to do this to, to really promote water loss management in the United States in a very meaningful way and also integrate it with uh, water use efficiency programs. So we're very involved in, for that reason. Number nine, we need to solve our rates dilemma. There should be no conservation conundrum. The conservation conundrum being, well, you, you conserve water, rates have to go up. You know, negative message to the consumer. If we design our rates correctly, we can still incentivize conservation without sacrificing revenue stability. It's going to take a little more work than what we've done in the past, but it's, it's what we need to do. We need to solve this revenue stability issue because it's hindering our forward progress. Um, at the Alliance, we've built a whole website called financingsustainablewater.org. It's all one word. And we have a handbook and a rate model and, and all kinds of wonderful tools for you to help you address this issue. Um, and it, we're raising the issue of probabilities. We've not really thought about designing rates with a probability perspective. And so I'm going to give a shout out to Tom Chestnut's talk tomorrow morning where he's going to go through that issue with you. Number 10, let's give our customers a clue because right now they don't get it. They're not aware of how much water they actually use, and of course their ignorance is even worse if they don't have metered information. They complain about the rising costs of tap water, and yes, costs are rising, it's pretty clear. But yet they're willing to pay a thousand times more for it in a plastic bottle, without question. They have no idea how the utility system is run and what the nature is of the infrastructure costs that are going to support that system. And the irony is the American household on average spends about $523 a year on water and wastewater charges. Uh, and while that may sound like a lot, it in, con it in contrast, it's $707 a year on carbonated soft drinks and other beverages. So in a scale perspective, it's really a value. It's a bargain. And we've not done a good job at explaining to the customer what a bargain tap water is. We've got the lowest burden for treated water and wastewater bills as a percentage of household income compared to other developed countries and the highest water quality. And it's a large secret to our consumers. Um, so why aren't we making this clear? What, what do we have to do to give our customers a clue? We have to stop saying, sorry, we have to raise your rates because you did such a good job conserving. Instead, let's say, yes, we need to raise our rates, but your monthly bill is going to increase by about the same amount as a hot dog and a Coke. Let's put this in perspective for people. And yes, it's the media who loves to do those percentages of rate hikes, even if the absolute dollar value is nothing. But we need to do something more to get that message across. Um, Let's learn from the bottled water marketers. They are making that emotional connection to water for the consumers. We need to do that too. Consumers are our partners. They need to be our partners. And that's a foreign concept to most old school utility managers. When I was hired in 1989 in public affairs, I was told, you might be talking too much to our customers. I, we don't want to fill our boardroom with people. Just, you know, tone it down a little. 
So we're now entering a whole new way of looking at a relationship with a customer. And while we're here in Las Vegas, there's a campaign raging called Imagine a Day Without Water. Some of you who are on social media may be tracking this. It started yesterday, it's going through to tomorrow. Of course they planned this when all of us are here, right? They don't, that's how unplugged they are in with us. We, we, we as water conservation professionals need to integrate with the value of water coalition and make sure they know that we are a resource to help them with this messaging. Number 11, let's better manage our data. Data is soon gonna explode, especially as more of you are getting AMI and we need to have a lot more advanced metering infrastructure. We need to learn to use the real-time system information as well as the real-time customer information for management benefit. And we're never gonna get the smart cities that our president is talking about. By the way, the smart cities plan has no water stuff in it. Um, smart cities are gonna need smart meters and smart sensors, and this is all part of where the wheelhouse in which we play. And we need to be active in that. And there is an initiative, it's called AMI ABLE, or AMIABLE, which is an initiative to get at the, the, the lack of communication between all the smart meter systems, getting at the interoperability issue. I like to think of it as if Thomas Edison had limited his electricity to only a certain type of light bulb, we'd have hundreds of different light bulbs that we'd have to choose depending upon which electricity system we had. We, we don't want that for smart meters. We want all these systems to talk to each other. Number 12, as part of the data issue, we need an evaluation protocol. If you have energy experience, you know what EM and V means, evaluation, measurement, and verification. We need a national EM and V protocol for water efficiency. And I think we're not going to get uniform acceptance of the, our evaluations of our program successes unless we standardize an EM and V protocol. Because right now our evaluations are sporadic, sometimes they're not funded well, they lack unified standards for how the results are estimated. And I think our forward progress, especially in energy parity and arguing for that, is going to depend on more consistent and better analyses of our actual savings and benefits. Uh, so that's one of the things that's on my list. 13, we need utility leaders. Join our leaderboard. The American Water Works Association issued last year a water conservation standard for the first time called the G480 standard, and it's to measure water utility compliance with water conservation and water efficiency objectives. My organization, the Alliance for Water Efficiency, is willing to measure and report on utility compliance with that standard. And we're going to create a leaderboard on our website, just like a golf leaderboard. Who are the leaders, you know, in North America in complying with this standard? And so look for that. That's coming to our website in a couple of weeks. And I'm very proud to announce that Cobb County, Georgia, is our first utility leader. They are going to get a gold rating for their compliance with uh, the AWWA G480 standard. So join the leaderboard. Get your utility to be part of this process. Number 14. Now it's going to start to get a little more personal. Let's get promoted. Our competent water efficiency people stay in their jobs for decades. I know somebody who's been in their job for 35 years and has never been promoted. Why? Why is this happening? We need to change our managers' perceptions of us as single-purpose, tunnel vision advocates for water efficiency, when really we're, we're water resource planners, and we understand how the utility works. In water conservation, you know you have to get involved with operations, with IT, with customer service, with all of public affairs, with all of those utility departments. So why aren't we recognized as being utility leaders? Why aren't we being promoted? We need to change that, and we need to empower uh, water conservation people to elevate into management and to be general managers. And then lastly, let's train everybody to get there. We need to train this next new generation. They're going to be taking over the mantle from those of us in the old guard who will be sailing off into the sunset. There are a lot of us now who will be retiring in the next five to ten years. And we leave behind a very big void that we know can be productively filled by these wonderful young professionals that are coming to these conferences that are here today. And I have great hope and faith in our young professionals, uh, our millennials, who are very active. They are they are participating in climate marches. They are very involved in sustainability discussions. They care about the, the damaged world that they're inheriting, and they want to fix it. And we need to draft them into water efficiency, and we need to make them champions. 
Um, we, we need to recognize that academically, water conservation isn't always uh, taught. So I'm very pleased to see that even in academic environments, they're now beginning to recognize that water efficiency is something that they want the students to pay attention to. And I want to give a special shout out, welcome to the 20 scholarship students who are here uh, from the University's Council on Water Resources and the 10 scholarship students who are here from uh, the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Thank you for coming. We hope you choose our field. We need you. So I just want to finish by saying the Alliance for Water Efficiency, the organization that I'm proud to, to lead, is here to help you. That's why we're here. We're here to support water conservation professionals with the best tools and programs available. We have models like our water conservation tracking tool. We have a rate model on our financing sustainable water website and a handbook. These are tools we build for you to help you through what you need to do. We want to also work with business and industry. We feel that partnerships with business and industry will help further not only develop new water efficiency products, but help pull those business and industries into this network of water efficiency. We want to advocate for policies like water sense authorization, like getting our water efficiency rebates to finally be tax exempt from federal taxes. Um, we work in codes and standards on an active basis. We do research into water savings, uh, program evaluations, topics of interest like demand hardening. Check out our website and take a look at what we've got there. And we're really interested in getting a smarter customer. Uh, we've developed a, a video which I encourage you all to take a look at. You can post it for free on your website. We can even customize it for you to your own average water rate. We really want the customers to be partners with you in your work. And so we've created a support network at the Alliance for Water Efficiency to, to help promote that. I mean, that's why we created this organization almost eight years ago now, is, is to do exactly that, to, to provide you the support base you need to help you do your work, to link you to the issues and the new conservation uh, developments. We have lots of online resources. We have a consumer program called Never Waste. And, but I think the most important thing we do is we, we try to, to be there for you and to unite you. Um, at our annual member meeting last night, Brian Richter said, you guys are a tribe. And he's right, we are, we're a tribe. And it's a tribe that needs to stick together, work together, and be successful together. And so uh, I just want to tell you the Alliance for Water Efficiency is here for you, join us. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we have time for a few questions. I, I don't see wild waving in the back. So I think if anyone wants to ask any questions, there are, there's a microphone. Um, and you can come on up and ask a question. I guess the microphone's here and here. I'm happy to take any questions before we move on with the program. Yes, sir. Good morning. Hi, thank you. Good morning. Nope, it's not. All right. Um. Maybe flick the button. Is this working now? No. Okay. Thank you for your remarks mm -hmm. and thank you for everything. Um, so looking at how water conservation staff get seen more as leaders within the utility organization, obviously it's important for the utilities to start to recognize how conservation supports their core mission within the community and generates results. Um, as you've noticed with energy efficiency, J.D. Powers has done a bunch of research on how Energy efficiency programs increase customer satisfaction, and customer sa satisfaction generates higher return on equity and net operating income. Um, what are your thoughts on the messages among utility directors that they need to hear from conservation staff so that conservation is seen as something that is critical and integral to their effective management of the utility? Well, it's, it's, a, it's the question. It's a very important question. Thank you, Jonathan, for asking it. Um, and it's what I faced in my, my first job working at the Regional Water Authority of South Central Connecticut, because when, when I got assigned water conservation, it was, oh, somebody has to do it. You might as well be you. And 
once I got into it, I realized, no, this is, this is really going to be a benefit to the utility. And in public affairs, we routinely did customer satisfaction surveys. And we did a survey just before the conservation program started. And then afterwards, we did another consumer survey. And we, my general manager was stunned to see how much the consumer approval rating climbed after the conservation program. Because what the customer said was, we were happy to see you were doing something for us and that you were reaching out to us. And that customer approval rating is never factored in like it should be. I see more and more conservation staff who complain that although they provide customer service benefit, all of the costs for that have to be absorbed within their conservation budget, which consistently gets cut in times of, of, of fiscal need. So none of that is recognized yet, and so we have, we have to make this a message to utility managers. I think part of the good news is, as managers are uh, cycling as older managers are retiring and new ones are coming in, we are finding much more receptive audiences with the new managers. Um, I, I give a, a recognition to George Hawkins of DC Water, who in my opinion represents the new breed of water utility manager. He is very, very uh, persuasive. He is very interactive with his customers. He's the kind of general manager who wears a uniform, you know, that says DC Water, just like a meter guy, right? So he wears the uniform everywhere he goes. He talks to customers. He's very active in social media. He is very engaged with his customers, and his programs reflect that. And his staff feel very empowered to test new ideas on him and to, and to really take risks to do new things, because the manager at the top is saying yes to that. When my general manager was so dismissive of conservation, and then when he saw our approval rating climb, he began to think about, well, maybe we could do this or maybe we could do that. And I, I think that the trick is making that connection. And I was able to make it because I was already upper management when I got assigned conservation. And that's not what happens in many utilities. Uh, so I got to go into the boardroom of the utility and make my case. And that's why I say we need to get water efficiency professionals promoted so that they get into that utility boardroom and they're able to make uh, those arguments. And uh, I, I feel really pretty strongly about that. I, I think our next generation of changes are going to rely on those water conservation professionals being empowered like they are at DC Water to do really good and innovative things. Any other questions? Oh, we got one more. Good morning. Hi there. Hi. I uh, really admired your comments. Um, I work in the energy world. I work for uh, an investor-owned utility in San Diego. And I, I, I like what you said about the public's good charges being made available for the water industry. Uh, there's, uh, there's a little bit of an issue with that, though, I see, because all the IOUs in the state are regulated. And 80% of the water utilities in California are not regulated. And I think it takes a regulating mechanism to collect that money uh, I don't know if you could get a self-regulated uh, entity into place for something like that, but do you have any comments to see how you could make something like that occur? Well, you know, I've been doing a little thinking about this problem. And uh, first, on the, on the regulated side, the investor-owned utilities report to the Public Utilities Commission. And the Public Utilities Commission needs to develop the protocol for letting the public benefits goods charge money fund water conservation programs. That has to be done even for you on the, on the investor-owned side. But on the public side, yes, a public benefits goods charge would have to be administered by somebody. And I'd like to point to the state of Wisconsin, who bit the bullet several years back and started to regulate all all water utilities from the platform of the Public Service Commission. And while the public agencies were all like, oh no, we don't want this, why are you doing this? Suddenly, once they were under the regulation, they realized, oh, we can blame it on Madison. If we have to do a rate increase, we can say to our customers, Madison made us do it. And now you've got uniform public regulation of all utility services in the state of Wisconsin. This is not a model that's 
prevalent around the country. We might want to think about it. But in the meantime, there's got to be in every state some sort of state agency that could manage a public benefits goods charge. So um, we need to think about that. And the utility managers need to embrace the concept. In California, they're opposing it right now. It's an idea that's been floated, and they're not wild about it. So it's going to take some time, I think. But I think separating out what we're doing in efficiency and funding it out of a separate money pot just makes a lot of sense. I, I know funding it out of current operating your revenues is hitting all of you in the pocket really, really hard. It's a terrible way to fund a long-term benefit program. You'd never build a reservoir out of current operating your revenues. Why are we doing this with water conservation? So this is a problem we need to fix. Hey there, Russ. Uh oh, here comes my first heckler. Thank, yeah, right. <laughs> Thank you very much. That, that was amazing. Um, gosh, 15 points. I, I never thought after two or three or four you would keep coming up with more and more. And the last one, let's train everyone to get there, our young people. Brian last night was talking, he's from University of Virginia. Do you have any idea how many programs there are that are out there? Is that something that could be posted on the Alliance website? What universities have programs? like this for our young people? That's a great idea. We have not done that kind of a survey, but I think that would be a wonderful thing to do because those, those young students who maybe might want to go into this field would then know where to go to be trained. So um, I know Lane Community College at one point had a, a certificate program on water efficiency, but I don't know how prevalent it is around the country, but that's a really good suggestion. We'll, we'll take a look at doing that. Thank you.